<laughs> Hello, how are ya? Hey, I am actually doing great. Last night was the first of two district track meets for my youngest son. And last night he competed in shot put. Tonight he will compete in discus. And I am excited for him because as a freshman, he just made state in shot put. So nice. Yeah. It was a really cool moment. He set a PR by a foot and a half. And it's a good thing he did because he would not have made state had he not done that. So uh, pretty excited for that kid. Yay for him. Congratulations. What's the possibility of him making state for tonight as well? Pretty remote. He's currently seated eighth and only the top two in the district go to state. I mean, there's a decent amount that separates him from the others, but in practice, he's been closing that gap quite nicely. So he has to have a monster day and some other people have to have a bad day. So it's possible, but if everybody does what they're supposed to do, he won't make it. Well, and you don't want a couple of juniors or seniors to have a bad day and not make it to state so that a freshman can make it to state. You know, I, that's not what I'm going to root for, <laughs> much <laughs> right. as I want him to make it to state. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas in shot put, it wasn't that other people were having a bad day. It's just that he is very, very talented. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and anyway. a foot and a half beyond his PR is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, he's been popping even further ones in practice. And so he's like, all right, I know what I want to hit in state. So, man, anyway. Nice job, him. Yeah. So, how are you? I am doing great. I am about an hour away from going on a four-day trip just with my wife, uh, sort of a half vacation, half writing retreat, because we're both doing some big writing projects. And we have not spent time away alone. I think it was since COVID started. Whoa. Uh, yeah, because COVID hit and then... We were in the process of moving and we did take a trip to Missouri together, but it didn't feel like a relaxing trip together because we were trying to kind of get the lay of the land and understand Springfield and understand this college and understand the church. And just, we were really hustling a lot of that time uh, and did quite a bit of it separate. Mm. And so... But other than that, I mean, it's just been years and that is not like us. We really deeply value getting to go away together. So I am so excited for this. No doubt. No doubt. Well, you're an hour away from that, huh? I wonder, what is it you're going to be doing for the next hour? <laughs> yep. It's so important to me that the audience get to hear my voice on a regular basis, that I am willing to stall my trip with... No, just kidding. Uh, my wife is actually in the middle of getting our kids ready for school and, and out the door and kind of just all of that kind of stuff. So this is not actually stalling anything. But as soon as we are done, I am going to pack and walk out the door. The kayaks are already in the car and we oh. are ready to go. Ah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I'm super excited. So talk fast. So talk fast, yes. Uh, well, I'm happy to have you for this time because I need to... Well, one, I, I'm going to ask you a question here in just a moment because, you know, we ask questions on this podcast. But before that, I want to welcome you and welcome the audience to the very first day of our Summer in the Psalms series. Woohoo! I have officially yes. read Psalms that were on a schedule. Yes, I finally just last night uh, printed the schedule and I tucked it into my Bible. So I am ready to go. And for our audience, if you are intending to follow along and haven't yet printed your own schedule, uh, you can find the schedule right here in the show notes. 
Uh, you can also follow us on social media and we will post each week's schedule on there. So yep. here we go, Summer and the Psalms. And we just kicked off and we've only read the first couple of Psalms. And lo and behold, I want to talk about the first couple of Psalms. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they are so intriguing to be the starting point of the Psalter that I am excited to talk about them and have been thinking quite a bit about them. But you said you had a specific question, and I am very curious what it is. So what is your question is my question. Wait, did you get to ask the first question? I did. I did. I've been planning that for a couple of minutes ever since you said you had a question. That's not fair. Because <laughs> I'm a nerd. <laughs> All right. Here's my question. It's very, very scholarly. What the heck? What, <laughs> what is, what is going on with Psalms one and two? Like everybody says these two Psalms comprise the introduction to the book of Psalms. And sure, I'm willing to buy that for a dollar, which is a phrase I stole from my friend John. And I think it's hilarious. Um, sure. Fine. You say that. I'll believe it. I have no reason to dispute it. But why? Like, what is going on in these Psalms? So that's where I started. And I'm like, man, I'm just going to have to rely on Josh for this episode because I don't get it. And then I read a commentary and I think I get some things, but I think you get this better than I do. So what the heck? I don't know if I get this better than you, but I can give you my not having read a commentary thoughts. Oh, um, all right. <laughs> so I don't know that that's better, but there are several big themes that I really do appreciate in both Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Psalm 1 presents first and foremost the sort of this or that righteous versus unrighteous theme that is a major part of wisdom literature and the Psalms in particular, right? And it also presents the idea of Torah, uh, which I think this is from the Sandra Richter audio lectures that I listened to last year. I think she said that the Psalms are broken up into five chunks to be a reminder of the five books of the law that they are in part a meditation upon. Mm. And so this idea of righteous versus unrighteous, the idea of Torah, and then in the second Psalm, the idea of kingship, that is one of the things that is most confusing to me about the Psalms, at least to put it in the introduction, forces me to acknowledge, okay, I can't ignore the Psalms that are about kingship because they are apparently integral to the thinking of the psalmist and the the psalms the psalmistic editors what is the what's the <laughs> phrase i'm looking for there um the compilers the, yeah <laughs> we'll go with that right and and so to to put those two things together if we are looking for a well ordered universe Torah and King become these two touchstones for the people of God. Yeah. And I'll tell you, so Torah makes sense to me. Clearly in Psalm 1, the righteous person is delighting in God's Torah, which, by the way, Torah, meaning law, is not just a very technical word for law. Like, I think it depends on on the era in which it was written. I feel like in later Judaism, the word Torah became very specific to the five books of the Old Testament. But Torah really was a just a word that meant teaching. And so a Torah could be like a mom sitting down and teaching her toddler, you know, basic nursery rhymes or what have you. Like it's just it's just learning. It's just teaching. So this is I appreciate you bringing this up because this is one of the things that is most interesting to me about Peterson's translation of the Psalms 
he seems to actively try to avoid that sort of formal meaning in the places where I would normally think of something very formal. And I am grateful to know that there is a reasoning behind that. Yeah, there is. And I appreciate that reasoning as well, because I think here's the thing. So often, I think we bring our theological ideas to the text, and we bring Mm -hmm. our assumptions, and we bring our stuffiness, if you will. And Peterson, in particular, tries to relieve the stuffiness of the Bible and allow it to breathe again and allow it to just have life and a more natural flow. And I, that's what actually what I appreciate about like seeing Torah as a more flexible, a more loose word. Like you can go, oh, he delights in God's teaching. That is very different, right? Now, all of a sudden, the same posture that Mary, as in Mary and Martha fame, had when she just sat at Jesus's feet. Now, this is equally true as the rabbi sitting in a cold, stiff room going over the scrolls of the Torah, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because when I think of the Pentateuch, which is my what I think of as for God's law, it is in my mind the one thing that it's not supposed to be. I think of the Pentateuch as impractical. Hmm. Because lots of the law is for a different time and place. Lots of that law, not lots of the law that we're talking about, but the lots of the Pentateuch law is for a time, place, religious and national system that I am not a part of. And so immediately the idea of the law, even when I try my best when I'm reading like ESV or something, it immediately has this sort of impractical vibe to it. Mm. And that is so far from what God is trying to say in these Psalms. Yeah, right. And I think ESV says, and on his law, he meditates which is a perfectly valid translation for Torah. But even that feels stuffy to me. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you. But you were, we we bunny trailed a little bit. I think you were saying someone makes sense to you, but. Yeah, but kingship was hard for me to see in Psalm 2. Until, like, I had to read a commentary and be able to see when it talks about the Lord's anointed, Okay, he's talking about a king. And when he says, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Okay, so this is a way of acknowledging God instituting his king. So now I can start to see the kingship. Or, well, I guess it even says like his king on the throne in Zion or something like that. But still, the whole psalm is, to me... It's all of these wicked nations saying and doing horrible things. And it's like, but God just kind of laughs at them. And so it just, most of that feels like a battle between the nations and God. And the king is kind of in there and kind of not in my mind. And so when we say that Psalm 2 is all about kingship, it really throws my brain. Oh, that's so interesting. I am deeply caught, uh, or I was this time, I was deeply caught by the theme of kingship in Psalm 2 because of the flow of the thoughts. As a matter of fact, I'm texting you right now. One of the things that I like to do with a passage as I meditate on it is to write one single haiku about the text. Hmm. That gives me a very limited amount of space in which to try to capture the main idea and yet still try to capture the whole idea. And, you know, you read a commentary, I wrote a series of syllables, same basic amount of work, to be honest. (laughs) Um, And yet I still feel like you understand this better than I do. So (laughs) proceed with your haiku. Well, anyway, this text has... An interesting and wonky history 
in charismatic circles, but I don't want to get into that right now. Um, here's what I wrote as the main idea. Men seek to be God, but Yahweh sneers, rages, and makes his son the king. Mm. And Can you that, repeat that for the back row? Yeah, uh, if I, I have to reopen my notebook. Men seek to be God, but Yahweh sneers, rages, and makes his son the king. Oh, that's so good. I think that's what's interesting to me about this. Uh, and if I can go into like a really like weird mental set of gymnastics that was happening while I was thinking about this, what's fascinating to me is that the, st- the psalm starts with rebellious kings trying to put themselves in God's place by establishing their autonomy. It ends with God making his son the authority. If we read that forward a little bit, in the midst of his anger at men trying to become God, God's answer in the incarnation is to become a man and thereby become the king. There's something really poetic about that. Yeah, but here's, I I do love all of the symbolism and kind of the reversed concept being played out there. But I also struggled with this being a messianic psalm in some way. Like, how does this relate to Jesus? I write, I get the fact that anytime we're talking about the Davidic kingship, from a New Testament perspective, we're also talking about Jesus. Like, I, I get that theological concept. But what's happening in this psalm that would point me that direction? And I felt so dumb that I, I just couldn't see it. And then I went and, you know, the ESV says the Lord's anointed. Well, what is the word anointed? It's the Hebrew word Messiah. So, mm. okay, this is a messianic psalm. When it was originally written, the scholars think that it was a maybe something that was done at a coronation or at the birth of a new heir, and so like the promise of a future king. They don't really know, but it was something that was used probably around the kingship. But scholars say that it was moved to be Psalm 2 after the Davidic kingship had ended and and the reign was over. And it moved to Psalm 2 as a messianic hope, as a Ooh. kind of an introduction to the Psalter. And and it has that that flavor, right? The Lord's anointed, the Messiah, which once was the Davidic kingship and now is this expected, looked for figure in the future, which we now know as Jesus. Wow. I had never put those pieces together to think that the editors were not, of course, in the Davidic era. They're in the moment when the monarchy is profoundly in decline. To what degree we're in decline? I'm assuming there is no sense. I have no idea if there is any sense of when this editing process took place. So I don't know if it's in the divided monarchy period or if this is in exile. I mean, some of the Psalms are in exile, right? So presumably at least the final editing is that late. But boy, to think there is a wistful longing for the kingship that is gone and a looking forward. Yeah, I just never thought about what the royal Psalms would mean for the people of God in exile in between. Of course, this becomes deeply messianic for them. Right. Which I think gives us permission, if you will, to understand them in a messianic fashion today and to understand Mm -hmm. them through the lens of what Jesus has come and done. Yeah. And so reading that in the commentary really helped me understand Psalm 1 and 2. And just like you said, I will say, you're agreeing with the commentary that I read. So well done you, that these two themes, uh, the way he says it is, 
These are the two ways that God is affecting his will in the world, his word Mm. in Psalm 1 and his Messiah in Psalm 2. That is deeply moving to me. Like, it's more than just amazing. It's like that catches my heart. Mm. That the, the truth of God is one of the ways God is trying to affect the world and that the kingship in Jesus. I don't know. I I don't even know why, but something about that, I guess I just love the fact that God cares enough about the world to want to affect it. And that one way is really, really broad and like through everybody who chooses to participate. And the other way is really, really narrow through one person in order to make room for people when they can't do it themselves. Like there's just this really cool sort of interplay between the two of those that is just very inspiring, beautiful, powerful to me. Yeah, I agree with you. Once I saw it in that light, I really do like that interplay. But I have to say that like before I read that, putting Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 next to each other and saying these are meant to be read together as a general introduction to the Psalms made zero sense to me. So not only do I get to see these two themes side by side now, but one of the coolest parts of what I read in the commentary was that verse 2 of Psalm 1 and then the final verse of Psalm 2 form an inclusio, which the book ends, right, that just put a whole unit together. Because both of them have this blessed are or happy are the one who. And I love that bracketing that really helps me know, okay, they intend for this to be read as a unit. I needed that because I feel like the theme of Psalm 1 and the theme of Psalm 2 are so vastly different that I didn't know how to hold them together or even if I should until, okay, I can see the inclusio and that they're putting these two themes together because these are the two ways God's affecting his will in the world. Now I can rest and be like, okay, I can put these things together. Yeah. Can we pause on this word blessed for a moment that is part of this inclusio? Yeah. I struggle with so many words, but this is one of them. And again, great thanks to Peterson for pointing out words that I am quick to gloss over because I hear them too often. The ways in which Peterson translates the word blessed. In Psalm 1, he says, how well God must like you. Right. And in Psalm 2, he says, you won't regret it. Yeah. Yeah. What are we, I don't know what that word means. So yay for you. Well, yes, that, uh, that actually is a really, really good translation. Yay for you is really good. So there's the typical word blessed in Hebrew, Baruch. And that is not what is being used here. Oh, okay. The Hebrew word being used here is asrei. Uh, happy are you rejoicing for you, good for you. And when the Greek Septuagint was written, and the, and this was translated into Greek, they used makarios, which is the exact same word that is in the Beatitudes. And again, blessed are, are the one, like we, we know that in the Beatitudes, but a lot of translators have tried to get away from that word blessed because it's not quite pulling across the idea any longer in our English language. And so some translators have said, happy are you. I love what you just said. Yay for you. That's exactly what's going on with that word. That's awesome. By means of a lovely tangent, have I told you my funny Marcarios story? No. Oh, okay. So I am in seminary. I am taking an exam. I am not great at language, but I am taking a Greek exam a large chunk of which is vocabulary and then some translation, whatever. And at my school, you had to have an 85 in Greek to pass. 
So I am worried about getting an 85 on this exam. And I had left several words blank in the kind of vocabulary section of it. And one of those words was Makarios. And I could not for the life of me remember what it meant. And then in the middle of the test, somebody sneezed and I said, oh, bless you. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be funny if Makarios meant bleh? Uh, uh, <laughs> huh, I'm just going to go ahead and write that down. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's fantastic. Uh, so that was my sneeze point. Um, <laughs> that is, yep. And, and I do want to point out two things that I think all of this that we're discussing kind of highlight for me. One is the point of a psalm as well as much of scripture, you know, Proverbs talks about how wisdom is like hidden gold. Mm -hmm. There is an invitation that scripture makes of us to think deeply. And it isn't like our first reading of the Psalms of Psalm one or two was wrong. It was good for what it was, but the deeper we mine, the more we find. Yes. I'm always worried when I'm talking about like original languages or uh, something theological. I'm worried that people will think, oh, well, I didn't read that book or I didn't know that language. And so I can't read the Bible. I'm not going to get what they got out of it kind of a thing. Mm. And that's a, a real dangerous trap because, first of all, this is a great illustration of that because we got to two very similar points through very different means. And second, almost all of the tools that we have used are easily accessible if you're willing to do years of work. There is something powerful about the fact that God's word, the harder you work at it, the more depth you find. It is so beautiful and so powerful that it invites us to a lifetime of study, not just a reading. Yeah, I mean, goodness, that's Psalm 1 in a nutshell, right? I love the way Peterson actually translates this. Instead, you will thrill to God's word. You chew on scripture day and night. I mean, that's really what study is, right? I think we can Study can become a stuffy word just like any other, and it doesn't have to be. It can just be literally thrilling to God's word and diving in. Well, and the promise is incredible. You're a tree replanted in Eden, bearing fresh fruit every month. The incredible idea that a tree would be in season all the time, that's beyond the normal right? It is the normal way of things for trees to be in season one of the four seasons, right? Right, right. The promise that you'll be in season beyond the normal. You know, the phrase I used in my haiku for this psalm was, you'll thrive beyond the norm. Mm. That's what I want. And so, okay, I'm up for chewing on scripture, if that's what it gives me. Yeah. And that's exactly what we hope this whole Summer in the Psalms is. Mm. And I love that this is an introduction. It's an introduction both in terms of the concepts we're going to see, right? God affecting his will in the world through both his word and his Messiah. That's going to play out throughout the entire Psalms. But then to even set the posture of approaching the Psalms from the very beginning, all right, I am going to dive in and I'm going to allow this to feed my soul and bear fruit even beyond the norm. That's awesome. So as part of my and your sort of meditation and learning from Psalm 1 and 2, this is a great moment to turn to the audience and invite them to do something that's a little different from what we normally invite. Uh, and that is, I'd love to turn to the audience and invite you 
to dive in a little deeper to Psalm 1 or Psalm 2, maybe you set a timer for 15 minutes and just think about it. Maybe you read a book about it. Maybe you have a conversation with a friend about it. Whatever it is you do, I would love to hear when you dive into one of these Psalms, what is it that strikes you? Because there is such a rich depth. I'm interested to read this in community so that we can all benefit from what everybody hears and gets. Yeah. I would love to know what experiences people have by just meditating or diving in deep with God's Word. That's just awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Josh, let me also turn to you. I'm curious to hear what else you have been thinking about this week other than the Psalms. Yeah, so I was translating with John earlier this week. We are still in the book of Matthew. We will probably be in the book of Matthew for the rest of our lives. But um, (laughs) at any rate... You know, if you were really clever, you would figure out a way to harmonize when you finish Matthew and when your church finishes John, and then you would start translating what your church is going to preach on next together. That That's, would be an awesome little synergy. It would. And I joined the sermon prep team like halfway through their sermon series on John, which is a bummer because every week when I show up to sermon prep, I have translated the passage. And I haven't been keeping my translations. Uh, like I have little notebooks for each book of the Bible that I'm working on translating. And That's awesome. I don't have a notebook for John because I started halfway through the book. And so I'm like doing all this translation work and then just like recycling it at the end of the day. It feels wrong. Oh, however, knowing you as I do, I would imagine that the thought of having a notebook that had half of John in it was virtually anathema to you. Oh, yeah. No, like makes your skin crawl kind of situation. A hundred percent. hundred (laughs) percent. I will just have to go back and translate John starting in John 1 1 some other day. Uh, oh, that's awesome. But but what else? So you've been translating. Yeah. And so we got to the story of the rich young ruler, and the rich young ruler goes away sad because he had lots of possessions. And then Jesus looks at his disciples and says, it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And his disciples are shocked. And they're like, then who could be saved? And then this is the wild thing that I've never, ever noticed before. Basically, Jesus stares at them. And it's this it's this word, emblepsas. Literally, Jesus looked at them, stared intently at them. And I'm thinking to myself, what was this moment like for them? That some amount of time goes by and they're writing down their recollections about this moment. And whoever writes this down goes, Yeah, that's when he stopped and stared at us, isn't it? Like, what was that stare about? What was on Jesus' mind? Was he angry with them? I don't think so. Was he contemplating something? But somehow that stuck out to the disciples, that he just stared him down for a moment before he answered. I just find that little detail super fascinating. Man, there, there are so many things about this particular story and the kind of theological issues involved with it that I would love to use this story as a jumping off point for a future conversation because oh man there's just so much in there oh absolutely and I hope you can explain this text to me like you did Psalm 1 and 2 because when Jesus finally stops his stare and answers the disciples. He's like, yeah, well, that's just impossible with man. But with God, everything is possible. And I just want to scream, that's not an answer. (laughs) So maybe you have an answer. Well, if Jesus didn't, uh, I'm afraid that if I do, it's probably not super good. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, yes. What what could be worse theology than answering questions Jesus doesn't answer, huh? (laughs) I'm going to get oh, you to try. I, hey, nobody does heresy like me. 
Uh, all right. Well, uh, what kind of heretical thought would you like to share with us now? Oh man. Well, this is a this is a shout out to uh, a friend of mine who just published a book of poetry. The name of the book is Holy Roller: Poems on Keeping the Faith While Being In on the Joke. Oh, that's a fantastic title. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I love it. Uh, it's by Mark Schaefer. And a number of the poems are just brilliant. Uh, just, you know, we were talking just a few minutes ago about how deeply valuable it is to think rich, deep thoughts. And a number of these poems invite exactly that. And I just love, this is from... The very first, I almost said Psalm. Uh, this is from <laughs> Psalm 1 of Holy Roller. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is a reflection on, do you remember the moment when Paul gets shipwrecked on Malta and he picks up the snake and it bites him and he just shakes it off? Yeah. So this is the first two stanzas of his poem that is a reflection on that situation. It says, I was on the island of Malta when I realized I was in a type scene and the snakes couldn't hurt a holy roller. A righteous man has a satisfied mind and a protected existence, whether or not the second part is true. <laughs> <laughs> and this captures a pair of the apparently discordant truths that scripture wrestles with all the time, which are the fact that the people of God are protected from mundane problems like snake bites, except for the fact that they're not. Right. Yes. And I love his courageous tongue in cheek way of wrestling with that discordant vibe uh, or those discordant truths and sort of asking some questions about it. And, and so I'm, I'm just, I'm loving this book for its presentation of those kinds of things. It's just delightful. Ah, oh, that sounds great. What a great turn of phrase in that poem. So <laughs> it's love so it. clever. And there's a number of clever phrases like that. That's great. I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah. But in the meantime, well, we have arrived. Are you ready? I am ready. All right. Well, here we go with the Witch Josh question for this week. And ladies and gentlemen, in a retro celebration, this week's Witch Josh is Witch Josh is still a Tetris champion. Yeah, that is me, Josh from Oregon. I grew up not wealthy, we'll put it that way, and uh, the only video game device we had for many, many, many years was an Atari, and I played a lot of Tetris on that Atari, mm. and I was really good at it. In fact, my mom and I had this constant competition back and forth of who could set the newest high score in Tetris. And so I played a lot of Tetris growing up. And then when we did finally get an NES, I played a lot of Tetris on that. So anyway, my son, who is a gamer, like he plays all sorts of like first person shooters and different things. Like he plays a lot of games. He's really good at them. And I can't play them for the life of me. Like sitting down and try to play Apex with him, it's just not even going to happen. But he plugged in like an old N64 that we've got in a box somewhere. And one of the games on there was Tetris. And I was like, oh, let's Ooh. play. And we sit down to play and I still got it, man. I am just like flying. And do you know, this kid could not play at all. His Tetris skills were horrible. And he's watching me just fly through this going, how do you do this? And I'm like... This is the only game I can play, dude. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got skills on one game. One game. This yeah. One, one. Yeah. So uh, I am still a Tetris champion. So every time like he's like, hey, do you want to play Apex? I'm like, no, I want to play Tetris. Uh, <laughs> so there you go. I can play Tetris. That's awesome. I 
spent hours playing Tetris, except I played on the computer and I Ooh. played a knockoff called Notris. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it was awesome. That's all I have to say about that. Okay. All right. I do love that game. Yeah, it's a great one. I used to have like almost dreams about it. Like I would see it when I closed my eyes. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, and I'll tell you, I can pack a trunk for going camping like nobody else because I know how the pieces fit together. Ooh. So what you're saying is that all parents should let their kids play more video games because it's more practical than they think. Wow. That was not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> Um, I'm going to need to just end the episode now. All right. Well, you want to talk next week? Yeah, let's do it. All right. I'll talk to you then. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.